So right from the start, you see the labour movement and you see feminists making school board and educational politics a part of their work because they saw a chance of getting elected and trying to influence um, educational policy making. So another important factor in terms of thinking about Mary's step forward. So in 1894, she's been asked to contest the, the triennial elections. They took place every three years for the London School Board, and she's been asked by a, a local alliance of Labour groupings within um, Greenwich and including the support of the Cooperative Society. And I, her election platform included the following pledges, which might bring a smile. She wanted to see a maximum class size of 30. She wanted to see higher salaries and better resources for teachers. She wanted to see a common secondary school for all. She wanted the raising of the school leaving age to 16. She wanted free school meals and medical services. And she went beyond the standard labour education programme of the time because she also wanted to see state maintenance to make that increased opportunity reality for the very poor. The result was that she just missed election that time. She scores very well, better than any other Labour candidate in the whole of London, but she just misses the fourth Greenwich seat. What happens within weeks is that one of the successful candidates dies. Now, established protocol would have meant that the next best person in terms of votes cast would have stepped on to the board and assumed that vac vacant, newly vacant seat. And the correspondence pages of the London School Board minutes are full of immediate protests from all the different socialist groupings in Woolwich, urging board members to step in and co-opt Mary to fill that vacant seat. Again, one of them's going th round the loop. The, 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 the comment that was made from the Woolwich branch of the gas workers, who are convinced of the calibre of their woman, as it were, and as I read these letters, like you can almost kind of feel the collective shiver that's kind of going down the spine of these me the board elected members. Nobody backs her election. They go against the wishes of the local, well, a, a grouping amongst the local electorate. And they actually support the person who's nominated by the other Greenwich representatives, who's a male lawyer from Lewisham who just lost a local elections for the London County Councils. But they don't give up. Three years later, in 1897, they're there again, backing her to step forward for election. The context to the 1897 elections to the school board is in Woolwich, a um, very severe issue going on, connected with the lockout of the engineers, who are then in the middle of a struggle to win the eight-hour day. Mary is involved speaking at mass rallies, mass meetings, trying to um, whip up support for the engineers. And it's in one of those speeches that's included on the loop where she talks about um, the need for women to work shoulder to shoulder with the man with the, the men and urges to the men to feel sympathy with their wives at this terrible moment of struggle because if it's hard for the men to stand around on street corners, she said it's equally difficult for the women who are faced with having to try and make ends meet. The result is better for Mary gets elected and to go back to the point that I raised in terms of the importance of plumping, when you look at the statistics, it's significant that 77% of the people who voted for Mary gave her all four of their votes. So she gets elected. She goes on to make, make the speech that I began by referring to when I said that it sent a shiver down my spine when she's talking and, and, and campaigning for free school meals. Um, but the engineers are less fortunate. They lose their struggle and have to accept defeat in January 18. 98. She serves for a total of seven years on the school board, and I just briefly want to mention her success in 1900, which has to be set against the backdrop of the Second Boer War, which was a moment when Labour um, 
candidates more broadly had not done well because some of them were opposing the Boer War. And we're thinking about a moment when there was considerable jingoist patriotic verve being expressed, particularly, for example, around the Mafeking celebrations after the relief of Mafeking. And when I talked to Mary's grandson in the late 1890s, one of the memories that he shared with me was of, he, through a family story, he'd heard that her windows were actually smashed on that evening because she opposed the Boer War. She'd also proposed the teaching of peace studies within the floor of the board. Um, but nevertheless, against that backdrop, and think, remembering that this is in a town dominated by the arsenal, that she actually increases her vote share. So um, it's a remarkable achievement, given that backdrop. So what I want to give you a flavour now is of her goals within, as an elected member of the London School Board. She wanted to see an extension of the ele elementary system. She strongly opposed the scholarship ladder that was then being put in place, which was the only possibility for a skilled working class child who'd been deemed skilled in terms of how they performed on a selective examination of getting access to the secondary school system. She wanted to see a state educate a secular state education system that was both coherent and democratic, which for her meant popular control and involvement of the working classes who are attending the elementary schools that I'm talking about. She wanted to see elementary, secondary, and technical schools that were free and compulsory for all. These, the, the provisions that she talked about, and I mentioned those earlier when I set out her 1894 campaign, her program, she would fund them through the restoration of the educational endowments and what she was referring to there were charitable um, endowments that had been provided by philanthropists. And if you look at the deeds of the, the, the terms of those um, endowments, we're thinking about the endowments that ultimately led to the establishment of prominent schools like Harrow and Rugby, etc. They were often, um, the, the, the terming of the will, they often talked about the, for the education of the poor. And um, from... Mary's and the wider labour movement's perspective, these have been misappropriated by schools in the private sector during the second half of the 19th century. And they wanted to see a reallocation of those endowments that they would use to fund the kinds of policies that I've outlined to you. So she's arguing the case for these um, initiatives as an elected member. She also opposes the use of corporal punishment and during the debate on that issue, she actually takes in some um, physical um, aids, if you like, to support her case. And again, there's a cartoon that's going around on the loop. She actually took in to the boardroom um, at the debate a Beeson broom that she said was being used in the industrial schools at the time. And the one she was talking about was Highbury Industrial School. These were schools to which they sent well, Highbury was for boys. There were more of these institutions for, for boys than there were for girls. But these were schools to which were sent persistent truants, and in the case of the industrial schools, truants who combined, individuals who combined their truancy with some form of what had been deemed to be criminal behaviour. And um, they were, um, you know, we, we would be talking about and describing a harsh regime. And she and others wanted to... Um, abolish the use of corporal punishment both there and in the schools. Now, in the 1890s, um, already the power structures of the school board system are coming under increasing pressure from the Anglican church and weaker private secondary schools who are concerned of the competition to the, the schools they owned and ran, the competition that they see as coming from the stronger board schools of the time, particularly those that would be um, described as higher grade schools that were providing work for older children within the elementary system. And with the election of a conservative government in 1895 and 80, uh, sorry, in 1900, it looks very likely that policy change is going to take place. 
So it's against that backdrop, a concern to save the school board system and prevent its destruction, that she organises the National Labour Education League, which was the closest thing to a labour education policy, uh, sorry, programme or policy then in existence. What she wants to ensure is that the Labour Party has a unified position of opposition to um, prospective legislation and she wants to preserve the school board system and the Labour Party actually was divided on the issue, extremely complicated but one of, again one of the issues, that's, uh, one of the groupings that's going round on your loop would be the Fabian Society and the Fabian Society was split down the middle on the whole question. Some of who with, within both the Fabians and the wider movement were in support of the kind of scholarship ladder which she virulently opposed. But she wanted to try and have a unified position, not just articulated, articulated around a negative policy of opposition, but a constructive vision of what the, a state education system might look like along the lines that I've just described. Against a backdrop of opposition, considerable opposition, both from the labour movement and from the non-conformist churches and from the feminist movement, because women did not then have, uh, were not then eligible to serve as elected representatives on the authorities that were going to take the school board's place, by which I mean the county councils. So you had feminists opposing, but against widespread opposition from the grassroots, they passed the Education Acts of 1902, which abolished the wider school system. London got a stay of execution, but the following year, 1903, the London School Board was abolished, and Mary no longer served, that, that's the end of her position as an elective representative. One of the things that the feminist movement won was a compromise whereby women were allowed to serve as co-opted members in the wake of the abolition of the school boards, co-opted members of the education committees of county councils, and the London Trades Council try and secure Mary's nomination, but again, nobody backs it. So Mary is not amongst the five women included on the education committee of the London County Council. Outside of school board work then, I'm now going to move on to my fifth section and give you a sense of her as a socialist campaigner. There are a number of points about her personal life that I need to mention at the, this point. One of which was that she'd been widowed in 1900, but there is no indication of a legacy of any kind. And in fact, particularly towards the latter part of her life, she um, lives in somewhat impoverished um, situation. But the Adams' family, her husband's family, step in and pay for her son's education. And her son, as she goes to school and is educated at a progressive fee-paying um, school of the time, about which I could explore in more detail because there's contradictions here between what she does in private and her public life. And I do talk about this in more detail in the book, but I'm not going to have the time to be able to do that now. Um, so her school, go her, sorry, her son goes to Beedales, which was actually popular with some other labour movement figures of the time, including the person who becomes the first Labour Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald. His sons, two of his sons went there. Now, um, Mary spends a time, as uh, she doesn't return to teaching. It may be that teaching wasn't possible for her because certainly it wasn't always possible for people who'd acquired a certain reputation as socialist activists. Um, we know that. 